So we're in the book of Revelation, and uh, many of you were not here last week because of sickness, so I do want to kind of do a quick little intro. By doing that, I'm going to turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19, I'm going to read a couple verses for you to kind of set the tone of where we're heading uh, in these next, um, what, six weeks or so. Revelation 119, Jesus is speaking and says, write therefore, he's writing, he's ta- talking to John, so Jesus speaking to John, telling him to write, write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. What is seen, what is now, and what will take place later. John connected, Jesus spoke to him, through him, and gave him instructions on what to write. And so what we have before us is pretty handy. We have the outline in Revelation 119, the outline of the book of Revelation. One of the mysterious books of all scripture, this outline is before us. It's very simple. Write therefore what you have seen. That's Revelation chapter 1. John's experiences. He then says, write what is now. That's Revelation chapters 2 and 3. That's Jesus speaking through John to the seven churches. And then he says, write what will take place later. Revelation chapters 4 through 22. Dealing with that which is prophetic Things that are kind of, you know, uh, before, uh, you know, culminating. And then after the fact, after the second coming of Jesus. And so that is an exciting thing that he has delivered for us of those things that are going to take place in the future. What we're focusing on in this series, the seven is Revelation chapter two and three. The seven churches. The letter to the seven churches. These letters are applicable to us today. Not only were they for those churches during that time, we can glean and gain a lot of valuable intel regarding where we're at today. What we need to work on and deal with and accomplish for God. Now, um, last week we kicked it off and we talked about the church in Ephesus. We called this the mechanical church, kind of going through the motions. It's interesting because Ephesus really was an all-star church with an all-star cast. They started off on fire. I mean, they had the likes of the apostle Paul and they had Silas and uh, Timothy, uh, the, the Apostle John, and, and probably, most likely, uh, the mother of Jesus, Mary herself, was connected to that body and the, the family of believers. So an all-star church with an all-star cast on fire in the name of God for all things related to Jesus. And, and, and they were unstoppable, and they were doing incredible things in a very evil, wicked city. And they were making a difference. But it came to an end. They became mechanical. They lost their first love. They took our eyes off Jesus. It became more about, you know, just kind of going through the motions. Just kind of going through the motions. And, and, and what, what Jesus did through John is he gave him a warning. saying, you know what? If you don't return to your first love, you know, you're basically, we're going to shut you down. And the church was referred to, you know, as a, as a lampstand. And basically, God shut them down. To this day, a pile of rubble. Nothing. This all-star church with an all-star cast does not exist anymore because they became mechanical. They lost their first love. It can happen to this church. It can happen to any one of us at any time. When we take our eyes off of Jesus and we lose our first love, we just kind of go through the motions, and Jesus means nothing to us anymore. 
That's why during this time, there's exciting times, and the Spirit is exciting, and we're, we're connecting, and we're unifying, and we're seeing God do great things in our life, and in the church, and in this country, but we must not lose our first love, or we can become mechanical, and God could shut the doors to this church at any moment. So today, I want to continue this series and talk to you about the church in Smyrna. In verse 20, in verse 20, he says, the mystery of the seven stars. So 119, and now 120. The mystery of the seven stars. So the seven stars are basically, you know, they're, they're the, the, pastor, the, the pastors, the elders, the overseers, the messengers. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. And he explains, the seven stars are the angels. Angel, that word angel means messenger. It literally means messenger. So it could refer, it could refer, as we see many times with Michael and Gabriel, right, to, to celestial beings, angels, but also it could also refer to a human messenger. And I want to suggest you, based upon the context of this scripture, that that's what he's referring to, the human messenger. In this case, the human messenger is the pastor, elder, overseer, the star that God holds tightly in his hand to guide and to lead, oversight of the church. These seven stars are the, seven, are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Why is church referred to a lampstand? Because the church's purpose is to shine the light of Jesus. And when we don't fulfill our purpose and we become mechanical, right, he, he takes away our light and we shine no more. Which was the case in this church just a little over 10 years ago or so. So close, but God resurrected and, and he's doing a great work. And we must allow that to continue. So today we are going to talk about the church in Smyrna, the church in Smyrna. And so this is a, uh, a very interesting church. We are calling this the fearful church, the fearful church. Now, we don't want to be the fearful church, but if we're not careful, we could be the fearful church. Now, I will say this. As you're about to discover, Smyrna was not the fearful church, but they could have been. They had every right to be the fearful church, but yet they chose not to be the fearful church. But we could be the fearful church if we're not careful. We're living in interesting times, and so were the Christians in Smyrna. Smyrna was located along the coast in, in what I believe is now modern-day Turkey. They lived along the coast, um, probably 30 miles north of Ephesus. So when the mailman, you know, uh, went to Ephesus, he would next go up, up to Smyrna. You know, 30 miles north and along the coast. It was a large port city. It was very uh, wealthy and influential they were really good there at the sciences and the medicine, and it was really kind of like a thriving place to be. Smyrna. Also with Smyrna, they participated in what's known as emperor worship. Emperor worship, where they would worship the one in charge, the emperor, the, the Caesar. Very, very interesting because there's a lot of similarities today with this country and other countries when we talk about who's in charge. Who's really in charge? That's what we should be asking. And so they participated in emperor worship. Tiberius was Caesar. In AD 23, they put together a temple in his honor. And so it was required... It was required for people, for citizens of Smyrna, once a year to offer incense at the altar in the name of that Caesar. This, in this particular case, it was Tiberius. 
And so when you would go offer incense at the altar as an act of worship to this emperor, the one in charge, you were given a certificate of completion. Yeah, very interesting. A certificate of completion, your, your access card to do whatever you wanted. You were given this certificate if you burned incense and worshipped Tiberius. And you would carry this around and show this, and this would get you access and allow you to continue life uh, the way you wanted to live in a very comfortable way. And so it became very interesting that the Christians in that area refused to do so. Instead of saying, Caesar is Lord, they would say, no, Jesus is Lord. Could you imagine that? Everyone there is like worshiping Caesar, and you get this access, and you get this certificate, but yet if you, if you don't participate in worshiping Caesar, then you are an outcast. That was the church. That was Christian. So if you lived during that time and you didn't go through with it and you didn't get the certificate, you were in a heap of trouble. Persecution and poverty, just like that. None of this. None of the safety. None of the being comfortable. Oh no, it's a whole different level at that point. And then you had, very interesting, in Smyrna, a strong Jewish population under Roman rule, but a strong Jewish population existed. So the Romans, they didn't mind the Jewish religion, so they were exempt to emperor worship. So you had the Christians, those who named the name of Jesus, Stand up and say, no, Caesar isn't king, Jesus is king. So what is the difference between Jewish religion and Christianity? The difference is Jesus. He's the difference. So the Jews, they were all about God. Oh yeah, they were all about rule keeping and honoring God and worshiping God and everybody could accept that. But when you name the name of Jesus, when you took a stand for Jesus, that separated everything. And he really put the Christians in a difficult spot. What do we do? They weren't accepted in the Jewish synagogues anymore. They weren't accepted by the Romans anymore. So they they underwent persecution and they experienced poverty because they didn't have the ticket. They didn't have access to the funds that were available to them. But yet, through it all, they took a stand for Jesus. And so they weren't the fearful church, but they could have been the fearful church. And if we're not careful, we don't want to be the fearful church, but we could be the fearful church. We have experienced things in the last couple of years that are eerily similar to what they experienced. Very interesting. And now more than ever, we need to make the decision, what will I do? What will we do? We make the decision now because there's a good chance we're going to be tested later. So you don't make the decision in the middle of the battle. You make the decision now. Jesus is Lord and nobody else. So we're here with the church of Smyrna. And the main idea this morning, the main idea this morning is this. It comes down to the fact that there will be people that will treat us wrong especially when we take a stand for what's right. People will treat us wrong when we take a stand for what's right. You can guarantee it. And the church of Smyrna is evidence to that. We can learn a lot from them because I believe they are a picture of our future. Whether we're here or not, it's a picture of what will probably take place. So we need to make that decision. The world will treat us wrong, especially when we take a stand for what's right. And so that is the question. Will you take a stand for the things of God, the things of Jesus? Will you declare Jesus is Lord? 
when everyone around you says the opposite? So they became Christians in Smyrna. The good news came to them. They were faced with a decision. You know, do I believe in Jesus? Yes, I do. Okay, now I believe in Jesus. Now we have a lot more at stake. My life is at stake. My spouse's life is at stake. My kids' lives are at stake. What will I do? I think it's interesting today in our culture, in our country, that there's three prevailing myths. Three prevailing myths that happen when we become Christians that we're told by, well, I think well-meaning people. But you wonder. So you have three myths. First, the first myth is this. It's that when you become a Christian, myth number one that we're told is that you'll, you'll have no, no problems. <laughs> There'll be no problems. And I got to tell you, I mean, that's, you know, that's intoxicating to think about. No problems? Yeah, you come to faith in Jesus, you give your life to God, you go to church, you do it the right way, you're going to be problem free. There's not going to be any more problems. It's going to be fine. You're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wonderful. You're going to be happy all the time. It's going to be exciting. That, my friends, as you know, is a myth that is not true. But many people kind of, they, they sign up for the conference. They buy the book. It's intoxicating. It's appealing. And, and what happens is, is that as a Christian then, when you have a decision to make, am I going to say Jesus is Lord? and I face the problems that happen around me and to me, it gets real. And then you have many people that kind of walk away from the faith because now I have problems. I didn't think I was going to have any problems. But it's a myth. The second prevailing myth that when you become a Christian that people kind of preach and teach and write about is the myth that There'll be no, you'll have no enemies. No problems, no enemies. Hey, we're off to a good start. So I'd be up for Jesus. You are not going to have any enemies. You know, everybody's going to love you. You are a new person. And at first, it's absolutely true. Before Jesus, you were a pain in the butt. Before Jesus, you were terrible. You were mean. You were angry. But he changed your life around. And people are like, oh, wow, you're different. But now you're talking about Jesus. Now you're pointing people to God through Jesus. And, and here's the thing. They don't like that anymore. They liked you at first when you changed your life. But now when you start talking about Jesus, love and living for Jesus, and telling them about Jesus, and how he's everything and the only thing, then it changes. And now like, oh no, they don't like me anymore. And, it, and, and it's so tempting. You see people that have enemies kind of, Walk away from the faith because of the myth. What did Jesus say? He said, in this world, you will have trouble. What else did he say? He said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. There are going to be enemies. There's going to be problems. And the third myth that we hear is that there's going to be no more, no more pain. No problems, no enemies, no pain. You know, if you give your life to Jesus, then you're just going to be blessed every single day. You're not going to have any more financial pain, no physical pain. And if you do, something's wrong with you. You're out of whack. You're out of line. But then you study like Job and, and Jesus, like they experienced real pain. And you can't get any better than Jesus, yet he experienced pain for all of us. So it's just a myth. There will be problems you got problems, I got problems, all God's people got problems. Amen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Right. In this world, there will be enemies. Enemies of Jesus, there always was, there always will be. Until one day, we're told every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. And there will be pain, and there will be suffering as a test. Who is our allegiance to? And we understand as Christians now, as we dive into Scripture, we understand that pain is for us to profit, not for us to perish. 
when I'm in pain, I realize I can't handle this. I need, I need God, and I need Jesus. Pain is a wake-up call that something's wrong with me, and it's sin, and I need a Savior. And God says, I provided him. My son Jesus came for you. So whenever we face problems, enemies, and pain, it should always point us to Jesus. Always point us to Jesus, which takes us to our passage today, Revelation chapter 2. Chapter 2, we're going to start with verse 8. The church in Smyrna. Jesus is speaking to John, through John, to the church in Smyrna. To the angel of the church, the angel is the messenger, human messenger, pastor, elder, overseer, the one that God holds tightly in his hand. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write this. And that word write is like, an, like do it now. D- don't hesitate. Do it quickly. Write this. These are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. So my question, who is the first and the last? And who's the one who died and came to life again? His name is? Jesus. Jesus. So yes, these are the words of him. Who's him? Jesus. When Jesus speaks, we need to listen. Why? Because of his credentials. His credentials say, who else can do this? He's the eternal one. No one else can claim this, the first and the last. He died and came back to life again. There's no one else like Jesus. Jesus is Lord, and so we got to praise him and listen to him. These are the words of him, the words of Jesus, who is the first and last, who died and came to life again. Verse 9, Jesus says this, I know your afflictions and your poverty. I know about them, yet you're rich. He says, I know, I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but instead they are a synagogue of Satan. Woo! I got to tell you, I've been reading this passage all week, and I just kept, I just kept landing on that Jesus says twice in this verse, I know, I know. When you go through problems and and when you have enemies and you experience pains you know what jesus says he says i know i know because i've been there and i've experienced it i know and when jesus says i know he really means it you know when we talk to people you know when someone comes to us you know i know what you're going through and do we really not really but we try to emphasize but when jesus says i know he knows he's all-knowing He knows it all. And that's comforting to me. And I hope it's comforting to you. I know your afflictions and poverty. They're going through some tough times. In the name of Jesus, Caesar isn't Lord. Jesus is Lord. So they're giving up everything. They're experiencing heartache and financial poverty and and ruin. Yet he says, through all that, you're, you're rich. And I kept thinking about this, that this week. He says, you're rich? Like, they give up everything in the name of Jesus, yet he looks at them and he says, you're rich. We would look at them and say, you're foolish. And that's what the world does. They look at what we give up for the name of Jesus and they say, you're foolish. But God looks at us through the eyes of Jesus and says, no, you're rich. You are loaded. So I got thinking about that. I got thinking about the people that I know who are in poverty, who don't have a lot physically but some of those people are so rich spiritually so rich because they don't have the struggle of having all these things that get in the way of the relationship with God through Jesus and they're really left with nothing they're at the bottom and they're praying all the time and they're trusting God all the time and some of the heroes of faith are people that were just poor in poverty when it comes to the things and the ways of the world, but when it comes to Jesus, they were so rich spiritually. They were so hungry for the things of God because that's all they had. Sometimes, I, you know, I'm grateful for what God has given me, but I remember the days when I didn't have much and we didn't have much, and we were more, in, more in t- 
intentional about praying and seeking and trusting and everything was a blessing and everything was a miracle and we tend to lose that and that's the danger when God gives you what you ask for you tend to lose it you become mechanical and then you you could become fearful because now I don't have it anymore what am I going to do without it I'm not going to be able to exist these people had nothing absolutely nothing they were nobody but God looks at them through the eyes of Jesus and says you're rich you're rich and I know about the slander of those who say they're Jews so now God's own people they say they're Jews but they're not instead he calls them a synagogue of Satan Jewish people worship God in a synagogue they came to a place like this and they worship God but God looks at them and Jesus declares they are a synagogue of Satan because they denounced the name of Jesus. They rejected the Messiah, God's provision for their sin problem. They're all about what they do instead of what Jesus has done. They wanted nothing to do with Jesus. They, they rejected Jesus. And anyone who names the name of Jesus, they're going to slander and they're going to persecute. And that's what they did to the Christians in Smyrna. I mean, these were God's people that he rescued from Egypt to set them free. And he brought the Messiah through them. And yet they become a synagogue of Satan because they took their eyes off Jesus. And they wouldn't acknowledge Jesus. In verse 10, he says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid about what you're, going, uh, what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil, the devil is going to put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. But be faithful, even to the point of death. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. Ooh, there's a lot there. He says, don't be afraid. They're going to persecute you. You're going to, they're going to slander you. You're not going to be allowed in church because of this Jesus. But don't be afraid what you're about to suffer. It's not if, it's when. I tell you, the devil, and the devil's behind all this. Four out of the seven churches, the devil is mentioned. The devil's behind all of this disaster we see. All the, the persecution and the poverty that they had to experience and that we experience as believers today. The devil's behind it all. The devil will put some of you in prison to test you. That word test really is neutral. It depends, on one, it depends on the one who's administering the test and the purpose of the test. Satan is testing you so that you turn your back on Jesus. He's making it rough and tough and difficult so that you turn your back. He, I'll put them in prison. I'll take away their money. I'll take away their rights, and I'm going to put them in prison. And he says, this is interesting, we're going to do it for 10 days. So is this a literal 10 days? It's not. It's not. It's, it's, it's figurative. It's, it's metaphorical. So it's not like, okay, I'm on day nine. I'm almost there. Woo! No, it's not a literal 10 days. But what this tells me is that there, there is an end. There is an end to the persecution. There is an end. We don't know, and I don't know what day you're on, but there is an end. And Satan's behind it. He's trying to test you, to trip you up, to snuff you out, to eliminate you. But we're going to pass the test because Caesar isn't Lord. Jesus is Lord. And he's everything. And he goes, through all that, even the testing, be faithful to the point of death. And many of them, if not all of them, die for the name of Jesus. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I'll give you life as your victor's crown. This is the crown given to those at the judgment seat of Christ for giving their life in the name of Jesus, dying for Jesus. We are seeing that today around the world, not so much here in our country at this point, but around the world almost every day someone gives their life because they, they, they declare the name of Jesus. Jesus is Lord. And they denounce the false religions, the false gods. And they will have this victor's crown that's given to them at the judgment seat of Christ. He concludes in verse 11 and says, whoever has ears, right? So you better listen up, he says. Whoever has ears, let him hear. 
Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. What's the second death? The second death is a lake of fire. Satan, demons, those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire, which is considered the second death. So he's saying that here, the one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Other translations use the word overcome. So the overcomer will not experience the second death. And so you think of overcomer, you think of the fact that positionally, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, he saves you from the penalty of sin and gives you forgiveness of sins and eternal life, eternal security because of what Jesus has done on your behalf. So positionally, we are all, as believers in Jesus, overcomers, and we will not experience the second death. And he uses that extreme case, but on an an experiential level, we're going to be faced, like the church of Smyrna, with challenges. Is Jesus going to be Lord? Are you going to follow his will and his way, his path and his plan? And when you do, you, you live like an overcomer. Because that's positionally who you are. Unfortunately, today, the church has been afraid. The church has been afraid of what they're going to say, what they're going to do, what they're going to take away. They've been afraid. And so even though positionally the church, if they believe in Jesus, are overcomers, experientially, they live like they're overcome by the world, by the government, by what people say to do. And that's the challenge. So I don't want to be the fearful church, but if we're not careful, we can be the fearful church and be afraid. And I've admitted this to you before, during those three months of the shutdown, the thing that hits me the most is when somebody came here at 9.30 a.m. and tried to open those doors, you couldn't open them. And I was in here taping, and you could, if someone went out there and tried it, you could just hear the rattling. And we locked the door for three months. Shame on me. Shame on me for that. Was it fear? It probably was. Was it ignorance? Yeah, a little bit of that too. But we've learned a lot. And that's, that's really the, that's the takeaway from this. What are you learning based on your mistakes so you can become stronger in the name of Jesus? We need to overcome the fearful church mentality. The fearful church mentality. And I think there's three things we need to keep in mind. We can overcome the fearful church mentality, number one, when we're aware. We're aware of the fact that there is an enemy who hates us, wants to hurt us, and wants to eliminate us. If you name the name of Jesus, there's a target on your back, and he's aiming every single day. You will have problems, you will have enemies, and you will have pain. He's trying to snuff you out and take you out. He's trying to eliminate you from the race that God has put you in, to finish well and to finish strong. We need to be aware of that. Sometimes I think people get like freaked out by it. They're like, and they become afraid. Like, oh no, oh no, what am I gonna do? They don't like me. You know, this hurts, it's not easy anymore. No, accepting Jesus is easy. Cost him everything, cost us nothing, but fully following Jesus can cost us everything. Jesus says, if you wanna gain your life, you gotta lose it. He gained our life by losing his we got to be aware, this is going to be tough. Don't be shocked. Don't be freaked out. Say, okay, I was expecting this. And then you say, okay, I got 10 days. I got 10 days. And you trust God through those 10 days, but you have to be aware. There's an enemy. He's at work, especially when you want to fully follow Jesus. And you start reading your Bible and praying and coming to church and taking a stand for God. Oh, yeah, be aware. We can also overcome the, uh, the uh, fearful church mentality when we are fearless. Fearless. We're fearless. We believe that our God can do anything and everything. Yeah, you're going to come after me, and you're going to say bad things about me, and you're going to try to shut me down and shut me up, and you're going to try to cancel me and eliminate me. Bring it on. Right. I, have nothing, I have nothing to fear. God has saved me. He's rescued me. I have a home in the heavens. If church in Smyrna went through what they did, why can't I do it? Why can't you do it? There is no stinking excuse. We need to be fearless 
That means we need to take a stand. We need to speak up, speak out, get things done for God. Don't make it about you. Make it all about Him. Roll up your sleeves. God tells you to do something. Get it done. Are you going to be criticized? Yeah. Is it going to cost you time, energy, and money? Yeah. Is it worth it? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Got to be aware. Got to be fearless. And to overcome the, the fearful church mentality, we must be faithful. Smyrna, they, they, they became aware pretty quickly. They were fearless, but they were also faithful. We must be faithful. We could become faithful when we exercise our, not a trick question, faith. Faithfulness comes from faith. Faith in who? Jesus. Faith in Jesus. Our faith in Jesus is very important because... He, He fulfilled his promise. He did the work, and he's not in the tomb anymore. He rose from the dead, conquered sin, conquered death, ascended to the right hand of God the Father, preparing a place for us. His credentials prove it. We can be faithful because he was faithful. And when we're faithful, we begin begin to shine for God in this dark world. So the church is a lamp, and our light shines brightly, the more faithful we become. And if you want to be faithful, depend upon your faith in Jesus and exercise that faith every single day. And when you do, your light shines for him. So we all have these smartphones and they have these stinking like um, flashlights on them or helpful at times, but every once in a while, right, we'll be walking around with our phone and somebody will come up to us and say, hey, your flashlight's on. I'm like, oh, gee. It's embarrassing. Someone got your flashlight's on. Ha, ha, ha. You know, it's like, oh, no. But you take that illustration and you connect it to faithfulness. And when you walk around this world, in this dark world, your light better be on. Amen. And when people come to you and say, hey, your light is on, you're shining. Wow, who are you? What are you doing? Why are you doing this? It's because of Jesus. He's changed everything for me. And I'll be faithful to him. And when you do, your light shines. And so it's not an embarrassment. It's really an encouragement. It's an encouragement. This world will give us a lot of trouble. They'll treat us wrong, especially when we take a stand for what's right. The church in Smyrna, very interesting. You know what they did to those people who named the name of Jesus? They did many things to them that were terrible. Terrible. So they would gather a bunch of them up, families together, and they would bring them into a big stadium full of people, spectators, cheering. And they'd be in the middle of the stadium, and they would let these wild animals, these, like these lions, go out and, and would just tear them apart and eat them up. Could you imagine? Could you imagine if we were there? That was us? Would you do it, number one, Did you sign their certificate? If you didn't, you're in there. Could you imagine if if we were placed in that stadium and the people that lived around us and near us that we see every day in this community were there and they were cheering for us because a lion came and ate my kid and would eat me and tear me apart? They were cheering even louder and louder because we named the name of Jesus. Could you imagine? You can't imagine. I can't imagine that. It's unfathomable to think about. They lived it. Not only that, imagine taking your wife, tying her to a pole, putting tar all over her, and then lighting her on fire as a torch. Imagine taking your kids and putting animal skins around them so the wild dogs would come and attack them and eat them. On the back, that's what they did. Yet they still named the name of Jesus. Caesar isn't Lord. Jesus is Lord. They would crucify them on crosses. If you name the name of Jesus, you didn't have the paper. You weren't a part of the Jewish religion because the Jewish religion had nothing to do with Jesus. They were just Jews by, by uh, physically Jews. They weren't spiritually Jews. Could you imagine 
Yet at the end of the day, they were fearless. They were faithful. They were committed. They were all in because they were aware of what they were signing up for. When you sign up for Team Jesus, you put it all on the line. Now, I know this is going to be a little controversial, but I haven't done this in a while. But when you talk about um, religious freedom, religious liberty, we like that, right? We, uh, we really like that. It's very nice. They had no religious freedom. They had no religious liberty. Nothing. They had absolutely nothing. And yet we have it. So I started thinking this week, what would they say to us today? They had nothing. We have everything. What would that church in Smyrna say to us today, the American church with religious liberty and religious freedom, who this week just won a victory, a landmark case? What would they say to us? They would say, wow, that's amazing. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? I think, here, here's, here's what I think what's going on. I think when a, when a baby cries, we put a pacifier in their mouth to shut them up. I think Satan, in many ways, he's sneaky. He's put religious freedom as a pacifier in the church's mouth to shut us up so that we're comfortable, we're safe, we can be together, we can do these things. But the church in Smyrna cries out and says, you got so much more to do. We gave up our kids, our families, our livelihood for Jesus, and you're not doing a thing. So the question this week with the landmark ruling is this, what are we going to do with it? Right. We, we have our work ahead of us. The world, just like that, didn't become less evil. Mm-mm. So what are we going to do? We're going to care for these kids? We're going to teach mothers and fathers how to do it right? The church going to come alongside and put the money where our mouth is? Are we going to do something? That's the question. So just because we have religious freedom doesn't mean we just say, okay, ooh, this is great for us. God's basically saying, I've given you an opportunity. What are you going to do with it? And the church of Smyrna cries out and says, do something. Please do something. You have such a time. And Satan's saying, I'm going to put a pacifier in their mouth and as long as they're comfortable and safe. But the church, we must not be silent by what we say and by what we do. Heavenly Father, we love you and praise you. Lord, we know the world will treat us wrong, especially when we take a stand for what's right. But the church of Smyrna, we hear their cry. They might be with you today, Lord, and we're grateful for that, Lord, but we hear their cry. And Lord, we will respond to the call to take a stand and to be fearless, to be faithful. And we are aware of the cost. We are aware of the situation, Lord. And we will use this time wisely as the church, as the people of God, as we come together and do the work of God in the name of Jesus. Because Caesar isn't Lord. Jesus is Lord. It means everything to us. And we really mean it. And we're going to live it and embrace it and go after it. But we know, Father, we're going to have problems. We know there's going to be pain, and we know there's going to be enemies. But we will take a stand for you because you took a stand for us. And we gather together as a church. We hear the cries of Smyrna, and we will do something with it in the name of Jesus because what have you done for us? And we're grateful and thankful in Jesus' name. Amen.